Okay, I think it's time. Uh, welcome, everyone. Thank you for for joining me on on your Saturday. Thank you for setting some time apart to uh, to listen to me. Um, so, first, uh, uh, b- basically, the idea uh, that uh, you know that, that came up to me, and and the reason why I started this. Uh, I'm thinking I'm going to be doing one of these live events uh, per month, and each month uh, we, we we can think we we can decide together I guess uh, a topic uh, a flask related topic to uh, to discuss. Uh, now since this is the uh, the first event, things are going to be a little bit I guess rough around the edges. Um, I I. I Never done this before, so I apologize if things are you know a little bit a little bit strange and uh, you know not not super streamlined. Uh, but anyway, that's uh, that's the idea. Uh, if you look in the uh, in the comments section of the YouTube page where you're watching this, <clears throat> there's there's a link to a Gitter chat. Uh, if if you want, you can join and chat with the other people that are watching, while while I do this. I see that there are there are a few already there. Um, and uh, hello, Eric. And um, I'm also uh, going to use this this chat, the the Gator chat, for for you to submit questions. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about that in a moment. Uh, what else do I need to tell you? Um, as a way to uh, to thank you for for joining me today, I I put the uh, the Flask Mega Tutorial video and ebook on discount. Um, so if if you were thinking about getting it, uh, you can get it get it cheaper uh, today. Um, so it, it's it's my little way to uh, appreciate you for for joining me here. Uh, okay. Um, the way this is going to go is as follows. I have a th- there are three questions that uh, that people ask me a lot, and I- I'm going to start by answering those three questions. And two of those questions are sort of technical, so it's going to involve me showing you code. Um, so, so they're not simple questions, and that's going to be the, the the main content of today's uh, live stream. And then during during me showing you, you know, all, all this stuff, uh, you may come up with questions. And what I want you to do, if if you have questions for me that I'm going to answer at the end after I'm done with uh, with my uh, presentation, is to put them in the Gitter chat. And the way you need to do it, I have a um, a magical contraption here that's watching the chat for for questions. And the the way you need to do it is to prepend your question with the word question, and then a colon. So I'm going to show you. I'm going to post a question myself so that you see how that needs to work. So question colon, and then type your question and hopefully you can see it now in the chat and that's going to put the make, make the question available to me so at the end I, I don't have to search through the chat uh, and instead I'll, I'll have the questions uh, ready for me to answer so that should be pretty simple hopefully uh, and the, the the way I'm doing this is actually part of the demonstration so I, I'm going to talk about how I'm doing this this thing because obviously I, I do everything in Flask and this is no exception. So I'm going to talk about this too. Uh, so uh, I think I'm going to get started. So the uh, the three questions that uh, people ask me a lot these days. Uh, okay, so number one is if... Uh, Hold on one second, sorry. 
So uh, question number one is if uh, Flask is better than Django. Believe it or not, uh, people ask me that a lot. So I, I'm going to expand the question and change it a little bit, make, make it a little bit more politically, politically correct. And I'm going to change it to why Flask is the, the best web framework. I'm going to change it like that. So, so I'm going to answer that question. Um, the second question that I get a lot is if Flask is able to, if, if you can use Flask to build really large applications, people think that Flask is only for, for toy applications, for small applications. So that's going to be the second question. And these two are sort of fairly technical. So I'm going to leave them for the end. The third question that people ask me a lot, and, and this is this is only in recent times, is uh, which of my two books is best? And that is, uh, you know, it, it depends on yourself. So you you probably know that uh, this this has been around for for like uh, three to four years, and now there's a second edition that's that came up like a week ago, and. I also have this guy, which is the uh, the ebook version of the mega tutorial. And you can see from the start, if, if you want to compare, you can see right there, there's a difference. And here's another difference. So the mega tutorial is substantially bigger, has more content. And the reason for that is that it's self-published, so I get to do whatever the hell I want with it. Uh, the uh, the O'Reilly book has some restrictions on size that were imposed by the publisher. So I had to find a condensed uh, set of uh, topics to, to cover in that book. Um, in terms of content, the the O'Reilly book, the, uh, the Flask book from O'Reilly, is more specific about Flask. The mega tutorial does cover Flask, of course, but, but it also includes a bunch of other topics that you are likely to need as well. Uh, for example, full text search, uh, Ajax, there, there's a, a fair amount of JavaScript, which of course, if, if you're doing a web application, you, you cannot avoid. So um, the mega tutorial covers a wider range of topics. The uh, the O'Reilly book covers a, a smaller set of topics, but it, it does so in more detail. It goes uh, uh, more in depth in those Flask in, in those core uh, Flask topics. So I would say that that's the uh, the basic difference. Uh, the the Mega Tutorial book is more accessible to beginners. It, it starts very easy, so the, the first half of the book is probably more friendly to beginners than the O'Reilly book. Uh, but the second half where, where I go into all these other topics uh, that include JavaScript and text search, then it, it gets fairly uh, complex. So so you, you can start with the mega tutorial and then as you gain experience, you, you will be able to uh, take advantage of the more advanced topics at the end. Uh, the, uh, the O'Reilly book is, I'd say, uh, I'd say it, it's intermediate level all through the book, so um, so yeah, um, I, I think that's uh, that's all I'm gonna say. Uh, uh, okay, so I, I just took a quick look at the chat. So uh, Torsten, please uh, please for for your question, uh, prepare it with questions so that I get it. If not, I'm not gonna get it. So okay. Uh, so that, that that was the third question. I'm going to go to the first two. Uh, and let's see. So the, the first question is uh, why Flask is uh, better? So I'm going to go to my screen. So th this is going to be a um, a very beginner introduction. introduction. I'm going to give you the, the reasons why I think that's uh, that's true. That Flask is the uh, the best framework. Oh, interesting. 
great. Okay, so for the questions, sorry. This this is why I said that this was going to, going to be a little rough around the edges. So there you go. I, that that that's what I'm seeing for for the questions. You, you can see it right there. And unfortunately, I, I was hoping that you will be able to vote on it, but uh, yeah, it looks like uh, there's a maximum of the number of, on on the number of connections. So some of you probably get to see this if if you connect to this website but not all of you, which is unfortunate. I, I didn't plan for that. So anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll worry about that later. Um, so, okay, let's get rid of this. Okay, so, um, so why Flask is the best framework? Um, so the, 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 the main reason is that if, if, if you are a beginner on, on web development, if, if you don't know much about it, Flask, allows you to get to a to an application very quickly there is not much setup that you need to do so what i'm going to show you is how how that works uh, and i apologize if 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 uh if you uh, know a little bit of flask this is going to be something that you already know uh but i, I promise you that the uh, the second question or third actually the third question is going to be a little bit more uh, more interesting so I'm going to start by creating a uh, a uh, virtual environment, and this is how most people in Python uh, create a project. Instead of installing installing Flask and uh, other stuff that you need in your globally set up uh, Python interpreter, uh, the 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 best pra practice is to create a separate environment, a separate copy of your Python environment, where you can install stuff specifically for for your project. So then each project gets its own separate environment where you can install things. So, oops. So for that, I'm going to do Python 3. This is uh, this is my Python interpreter. Uh, in your case, it may be called Python, it depends. Uh, usually Python 3 will give you the interpreter that you want. And then I'm going to invoke the VM package from Python and then I'm going to create a virtual environment with the name VM which is what I always do uh, and for this this second VM can be anything you want it, it's the name of your personal or uh, your private copy of the Python environment so there we go so now if if I get my directory here I have VM Ignore this thing that comes later. Uh, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to activate the environment. And for that, I need to do source vm vin activate. This is a little script that comes with the, uh, the virtual environment. And now you can see that this is activated. And that means that when I run Python now, it's going to be this this private Python that I have here, not the global Python. Uh, so that's uh, that's all, all set up. Uh, so now I can go ahead and install Flask. So pip install Flask will give me Flask and a bunch of other things that, uh, that Flask uses. Okay. And uh, now I can I can start writing my application. And here here's the uh, the big difference between Flask and uh, other bigger frameworks. Uh, in in those cases, you have to start thinking about configuration, and you have to create a, a bunch of files, uh, URL routing, you know, a, a bunch of things. So here, uh, all you need to do is write a script. So I'm going to create a script that's called simple.py and this is going to be my application uh, for this example I'm going to use vim which is a uh, it's a text editor you you can use uh, whatever editor you want or if, if you want something more uh, more elaborate like uh, PyCharm or Visual Studio Code uh, that, that's all fine a anything that lets you write text will work for uh, for this so there we go, we have an empty file. And what I'm going to do here is uh, 
think in terms of what I want to do. And what I want to do is that when I type a URL here in my browser, I want some Python code to run. And, and then the result of that, uh, I, I want to appear in the page. So it, it, it's a simple, simple thing to do. So I'm going to start by writing the function. And the function is going to be, uh, let's call it hello. And uh, all I'm going to do for now is return what I want to display in the page. And this is going to be, uh, I'm going to use HTML here because we're going to be uh, viewing this in a web browser. So there we go. So now, now I have a function and what I need to do now is hook it up with Flask and the browser. So I'm going to start by importing the Flask class, which comes from the Flask package. So uh, Flask with small f is the package. This is what we installed, what I just installed with pip. And then Flask with a big f is the main application class that comes with the uh, with the package. And this is the object that represents your web application. So I'm going to create an instance of this class. And the way you do it is like this. You have to create an instance of this, this Flask class. And as a, as a, usually as, a, as an only argument, you pass this uh, dunder name variable from from Python. This is this is a variable that Python sets to the name of your package. So in this case, it's going to be this, this simple.py name. Uh, the way the, the reason why Flask requires this is so that it knows where your application is, because uh, more complex applications will need to load. Uh, other files that are located in, on disk on the same place as this file. And this is going to uh, allow Flask to know where, where that place is. So there we go. So now we have an application. And uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to set a mapping between the hello function that I wrote and the URL that I want in the browser to trigger this function to run. So that is done with app route. This is called a decorator. And here I can write the URL. And for example, I can set it to slash, and that's going to be the main URL of the, uh, the application. So I'm going to save this. And there we go. So uh, this is all it takes. So now the, the top level URL of this web application is going to be uh, exposed through the browser. I'm going to quit here. I'm going back to the command line. And I need to tell Flask what my application is. So the, the, the simple the pie needs to be, uh, it's actually the only bit of configuration at this point that you need. And Flask takes that in an environment variable. So I'm going to set flask app to simple.py. And with that, I can say flask run. And there we go. The application's now, uh, oh, what's going on here? Oh, I see. <laughs> I have another thing there. So ignore those. And now, Okay, talk about rough edges. There you go. That that's my contraption for for the questions. Awesome. You know what? I'm gonna stop this. I'm gonna change it. Uh, I'm gonna put it on a different port. So here I am telling Flask to uh, to run my application on five thousand one. So now I can here go to. Uh, so you you can see here the URL. So Flask tells me what the URL is. Actually, I'm going to copy paste it. And that's my hello, everyone. So if I want now to uh, to add additional, you know, some other behavior, I, I can write another function. 
let's call it index and uh, for this one uh, let's say hello world so slightly different so for this one I'm gonna say app route slash index so this is a different URL so now, now we have two two URLs uh, I'm gonna run the application again so now this one is hello everyone and if I go to slash index then the it, it is the other function that runs so so with this you are creating a mapping between URLs and Python functions that run uh, normally they, they will do some sort of uh, calculation and then they will uh, return the contents of the page what needs to be displayed in the browser so so that is what I think is great about flask that with almost no setup you can get something going um, so of course the rest is going to be the, the logic of your application and that comes from you uh, so so really the, the uh, framework is, is really an obstruction it stays on the side it, it allows you to uh, to create this link between your functions and the web browser or actually any other HTTP client uh, which the browser is not the only one uh, so there we go uh, that is uh, that, that is why I think uh, Flask is, uh, is great uh, most other frameworks will, will, will have to start giving you introductions about things how to configure things create uh, data structures for, for these um, mappings between functions and URLs and uh, in Flask this this is done uh, simply with the uh, with this uh, with this construct that you put uh, above your functions which is uh, in case you don't know this is called a decorator uh, this this uh, at sign indicates that this is a decorator it, it's a Python feature for those that don't know uh, that allows you to uh, decorate I guess uh, apply uh, additional behavior to existing functions so okay uh, that is why flask is uh, is great uh, how are we doing on questions okay that looks good someone voted so someone got access uh, okay uh, I'm gonna answer these uh, after I, I go through my my last question the third question which is uh, why people or actually if uh, flask is appropriate for building uh, big applications so uh, yeah um, what a lot of people in my view seem to ignore is that if you need to write a big application uh, you need to know how to right uh, if, if the application is big that means that you're gonna to have to write a lot of code um, and that's the same regardless of you know Django flask pyramid you know whatever right uh, so uh, so big applications are difficult because you know you, you need to write a lot of code and uh, that that's difficult um, so in terms of the framework that you use uh, really the function of the framework is to uh, to enable this thing that I just showed to connect your Python logic with uh, with URLs that clients can trigger and uh, Flask does this Django does this Pyramid does this Bottle does this they, they all do it uh, they, they do it in different ways some are more complex than others but at the end of the day you know all that matters is that your Flask, uh, your your Python logic is exposed as a set of HTTP endpoints. Um, when you work with a big framework, then uh, there are a lot of rules in how to perform this mapping. When you work with Flask, there are actually no rules. You can do whatever you want. You you saw me just write an application that it's uh, it's just a single file, couple of functions and uh, and then I, I can continue growing it from from this and uh, 
say if, if one day th this one file becomes too large and I, I find it that it, it's kind of inconvenient to work with such a large file, then I can go ahead and split it in two files and, and keep going. And you, you can mutate the structure of your application as your needs or the size of your project changes. So, so that that's one big reason why uh, I, I think really the the choice of framework that you use if you want to write a big application is irrelevant, uh, be, because uh, really the framework is such a small thing, right? The the main thing is uh, is your own application. So, um, there you go. Um, so um, some people think that uh, because Flask has uh, almost no rules, right? In, in, in particular respects to the, uh, the file structure, the, the way you structure your project, uh, that, that that's a deficiency or a, a con, not, not a plus or a pro. Uh, I, I see it the other way. Um, I, uh, I typically uh, start my um, all my applications as, as, as this example, as this simple.py, and, and then I, I grow them you know, fr from, from here. Um, so, um, so yeah, I, I see it as a strength. Um, the fact that I have a complete understanding that, that this is all there is. Uh, so, so this, this is, uh, the entire application. And if I want to split it in two, I just do. And, uh, everything continues to work is, uh, in my view, super powerful. Uh, so, uh, what I wanted to show you in terms of the, this idea of growing applications and, um, you know, making them bigger is uh, this, this little um, thing that I built for, for the questions. Uh, so so um, th this is going to show you that I, I, I have, basically I'm flying by the seat of my pants here. I, I have no planning. Uh, so yesterday I was thinking that uh, how I, I was going to, see the questions that you uh, the, that, that you post to me and uh, searching in the chat I thought it was going to be kind of um, you know not not ideal so it, it was like 4 p.m. yesterday and I decided to, to build an application to uh, basically monitor the chat and extract the questions and uh, put them put them here so you can see that this is updating on its own uh, so, so th this is uh, this is the. Uh, I mean, it's not a big application, but it's the type of application that that you think today in terms of you know what most uh, businesses build. This is a, a single page application. Uh, it has a Flask backend, and then it's uh, it's JavaScript on the client. That that's uh, a, a fair amount of work as well. Uh, so. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to show you this. Uh, so let's see. So I, I'm going to show you the, uh, the the Python side, so the, the the Flask side. I'm not going to show you the uh, the JavaScript because if we do, then we're going to be here for, for a long time. Uh, so so maybe I'll leave that for for another of these uh, these uh, things. Um, and maybe we can talk about JavaScript from a uh, from a Python uh, point of view. Um, so this started like the previous th th this uh, simple.py example. Uh, it, it was a uh, single file. It remains a single file, but it, it is at a point where I, I, I will start thinking about breaking it in uh, in two uh, in, at, at least in two separate modules. Uh, this application has two functions. One is to monitor the chat where you are writing your questions. And, uh, and then the other is to provide an API for, for this client side, this stuff that's running in the browser, that uh, basically the client is uh, constantly asking the Flask server, hey, do you have any questions, any new questions? Uh, or, hey, uh, did, did any of the votes changed on, on these questions? And, and then the Flask uh, project response with all the changes and then uh, in JavaScript all those changes are added to the page so let's take a look I'm going to show you first uh, let's well, let's look at the the chat portion so 
Gitter, so th th this this chat that we're using, it's actually uh, very friendly. It has it has an API, so you can send a request to API gitter.im slash v1 slash rooms, and that will, that will give you a list of all the rooms that you have. And uh, to authenticate, you need to pass a token. Now, uh, I'm gonna make this a little bit larger. There we go. So uh, for for this, I'm using requests. This is a a, a Python uh, package that uh, sends HTTP requests. So here we have uh, th this this is a Flask server, but uh, th this server needs to send requests. So it also functions as a uh, client sometimes. So, so we are a client to Gitter. And it, you, you need to tell Gitter who you are. And for that, uh, Gitter gives you a uh, authentication token that you need to pass in this, uh, this uh, header on the request. So this, this token is in app.config and that's, that's one interesting uh, an interesting part of Flask, where uh, anything that you want to configure, you can you, you can just toss it in a app.config dictionary, and then it is available for the application to use. So here, uh, this this is my token, and because I don't want you to see my token, I never write my tokens in the code. Uh, so I have it in an a, an environment variable that uh, that I'm importing here. Uh, that reminds me that uh, uh, for the, those of you that are going to be at PyCon US in Cleveland in, uh, what is it, a little bit over a month, uh, I'm gonna, uh, I have a talk there specifically about how to deal with, uh, what, what, what are the best practices to deal with uh, passwords and secrets so that you never make the mistake of writing it in code and then accidentally Putting it on on GitHub or you know your your source control. So anyway, if, if you're going there, I look forward to see you for that talk. But anyway, um, I, I have configured three things related to to this part of the application: the token, then uh, the room that I'm going to be watching, which is this room that we are all in on the chat, and then what's the prefix that I'm going to watch for to uh, to find the questions. So uh, then, this function it it's it's uh it, it basically that logic is from line thirty six to line sixty six so it's actually fairly uh, fairly short. I send a request to get the list of rooms, and then uh, the response is in JSON, so I I can get the uh, I can get that converted into a Python list by calling requests uh, the the JSON method. On the uh, on this response object, and then for each of the rooms, I check if the name matches what I have in the config, and that's how I can obtain the ID of the room, which is a sequence of uh, characters. Right? It, it's it's a uh, an opaque ID that uh, Gitter assigns to each room. So this is how I find what my room ID is. Once I have my room ID, I can subscribe to to the feed, the feed of that chat room. And that is done by sending a request to stream.gitter.im slash v1 slash rooms slash the ID slash chat messages. And I need to send the same uh, authentication token and I'm gonna tell requests that this is a stream. So it's going to provide the contents uh, immediately. It's not going to wait until the request ends. It's going to uh, basically send me a live feed of all the messages that are coming in that, that you're typing. And then I, I do uh, iteration over these, uh, which come as uh, different lines. So I can do iter lines. And then uh, for each line is a JSON object. So I decode it to a data structure that I store in message. Just in case, to be extra safe, if there's any errors, I ignore that line and keep going. And then uh, I check the HTML version of the message that you typed. And if it starts with the prefix that I have configured, then I create a question object 
This is the uh, the object that I use in my database to store the uh, the questions. And uh, here I set the question to the HTML. Uh, so this is this is the HTML version, but I'm here I'm doing a little bit of string manipulation to remove the prefix. So I, I, I'm going to write the question starting on the character after the colon. And, and then I also write the name of the author, the, the, uh, the nickname for the person who wrote the question. And I set the votes to one initial, the, the initial value. And then uh, this, the, the set of three lines is what writes the question to the database. I need to add it to a database session and then commit it. This, uh, this DB object is not part of Flask. I'm going to go all the way up. For this, I'm using a Flask extension, a very popular, one of the most popular extensions. That's called Flask SQL Alchemy. Uh, and this is an extension that provides uh, database access for, for a number of databases, relational databases. Um, there are different extensions for, for different types of databases. Uh, so you, you're not limited to using this 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 one. This is the one that I like, uh, but uh, that that's another big benefit in Flask. Flask makes no assumptions about what what how you want to work with your, your data. So you, you you can do whatever you want. If if you want to write a text file instead of using a database, you know you you you, you can just do it. Uh, Flask does not care. Uh, unlike other frameworks where the uh, the database or storage layer is embedded in the framework. And so if, if, if you need to do something else, it's kind of difficult. Uh, so there we go. Th this is my database object. Uh, this is my question class. And here I define the, the three attributes, question, author, and votes. And then to, uh, to make the relational database happy, I also need to add a unique ID. And uh, this uh, this class has a method that converts the uh, the object to a dictionary, and this is uh, it, when you build applications of this type. That's useful because that's how you you can get those uh, those objects sent to the client using JSON, which is these days the most popular uh, content type or format to uh, to send data from uh, from server so from from backend APIs. Uh, so <clears throat> so here I basically create a dictionary that has all this all the fields, and I have an extra one here that uh, keeps track of your uh, your votes. Uh, okay. So. Uh, high level that that's how the first part works and then there's the part of uh, returning all this data, data to to the browser when uh, when the browser asks from the JavaScript side and that is oh actually I, I forgot one one little thing um, so th this is going to be a background thread so I'm, I'm gonna run this in the background it's going to be running in parallel with the web server so in case there's a crash, you know, who knows what happens. I don't want this process that monitors the chat to end due to a, uh, say, a bug or uh, maybe a service disrupt disruption on the Gitter side. Maybe they go down. I don't want this thing to go down. So I created a this Gitter thread wrapper that it, it's a while through, so it, it'll iterate forever. It'll, it'll run the function. Uh, it, it's uh, protected with a try accept block. Uh, if there are any errors, I, I just print the error, but then the while through will cause the, the, the function to run again. So it, it'll restart. And likewise, if the function for any reason, maybe a bug or whatever, uh, if it ends, I want to be uh, restarted. I, I want this to never end. So this is, this is a little bit of extra safety that uh, that allows me to, to keep this uh, in the background running all the time. So uh, let's see. Let's talk about this one. So uh, you, you've seen this uh, before. I showed you this in, in the previous example in the simple.py. Uh, so app.route is the, the, uh, the mapping between functions and URLs. 
uh, Flask has a bunch of others, and here's one that uh, that's going to run right before the first request is received. So this this is a, a, a place where sometimes you can put uh, code that initializes things. So here what I did is I uh, create the database and then I create my thread, which is going to be based on this function, the wrapper to the, the, the big function that does the uh, monitoring of the chat. I'm going to set it to daemon mode and then start it in the background. So this is going to you know, from, from the time the application receives the first request, it's going to constantly be looking for uh, for the messages and watching for questions. <clears throat> and then after that, uh, we have actually only two uh, two routes here. So uh, slash API slash questions is the one that the uh, that the uh, the client can uh, send to to get the list of questions. So, so it gets the entire list of question. Uh, here, uh, I have a little bit of. Uh, I mean, I I I, I like the, the way <clears throat> using Flask and Flask SQL Alchemy, you can do a lot in a single line. Uh, some people don't like this, and it's totally fine. You you you, you can write this in a more uh, lengthy way. But basically, what I'm doing this is I'm I'm using uh, this Python thing called a list comprehension to generate all those dictionaries with, with the to dict method that I showed you before uh, on, on the question object uh, for basically a query. I'm, I'm running a query on all those questions. I'm ordering them by the number of votes in descending order. So the question with the most votes comes first. And, uh, and then for each of those questions, I generate the dictionary version. And then all of that then is converted to JSON with this function that comes with Flask, which basically <clears throat> takes a Python data structure and returns a JSON version of it to the client. So there we go. This, this, is, this is how the client can get the list of questions. And then, uh, and then you, you can vote on the questions. Uh, so of course, uh, since I wrote this question, I'm going to let's see if it works. Yeah, there you go. So I voted the question. Now, now it's a two. So each time you click on the on thumbs up, and I, I apologize for those of you that uh, that cannot access this this side. That, that that was an oversight on my side. Uh, I um, so I, I as I said, I wrote this. I, it, it took me about three hours yesterday, and I'm, it, it's running on my machine. And that that uh, ngrok URL that you're going to, it's basically routing the request directly to this laptop from where I'm presenting. And uh, I, I didn't realize that they have that this ngrok service that I'm using has a limit on the number of clients that can be connected at a time. So um, for the next one, I'm pretty sure I'm going to have time to deploy this, you know, in, in the, the right way. And uh, then this is not going to be a problem. Uh, so anyway. Uh, let's go back to the code, and for for the voting, basically what I uh, what the client needs to do is needs to send a request to slash API slash questions slash ID, and the ID is this this uh, this identifier that the database assigns to each entry to each question. Now in this case, I, I'm going to use a POST request. Typically. Uh, so this is something of the, in the HTTP, HTTP protocol. Um, when uh, when you when a client wants to get data, it sends what's called a GET request. And when the client wants to modify or trigger some change in the in the server in the back end, it, you usually use a POST request or one of the other ones. There are others for uh, making changes and for deleting as well. Um, so this is going to be a POST request. And this is this is something that I, I haven't shown before. Uh, you can make URLs that have a uh, sort of a wildcard. Um, you, you you can make you, you can put anything any integer here, and this is still going to match this function. So Flask will will send any URLs that start with slash API slash questions, 
and then end with a number to this function. And the number is going to come as an argument. So I, I now know what's the ID of the question that's being voted. So, um, so then what I do is I record the vote in this, uh, this place that's called the session. And this is, this is a uh, storage that Flask allocates per client. So uh, if, if all of you are connected, then Flask is going to create a session for each one of you. And, and then the server can write data on that session. And that's going to apply just to you. So, so th th this session, uh, you know, the, the, the different sessions for the different clients, uh, they, they never mix up. So I, I can write in the session which, uh, which IDs you voted on. So uh, here what I do is I, I load the question from the database. This is how you, uh, you run a database query. And then session, which uh, th th this works like a, dic a dictionary. So session votes is a list. And then I add this ID to that list. So I keep track of all the uh, IDs that you uh, you uh, voted uh, to uh, um, you know, on on your uh, on your browser, and uh, I increase I increment the the vote count on that database object, and then write it back to the database with the updated uh, vote count, and uh, and then uh, in this case there's nothing to return, so I return an empty string. And here uh, I, I can do this. Uh, this number here is the status code, uh, which is an optional thing. In HTTP, you can uh, you can return a status code that provides additional information to the client. And uh, the the, uh, the standard one. So in this case, where I don't use a uh, predefined, uh, you know, I, I I let Flask use the default. That's going to be 200, which is the code for OK. This request was successful. And 204 is a code for OK, but I have nothing to tell you. So this is this is a code that you use when the request was successful, but there's nothing to provide in the response. And in this case, it, that, that's you know, for that reason, I provide an empty string. Uh, the, uh, I think the last bit that I didn't show is this other decorated function. It's called before request. This is going to run before any request. So, so whenever the client sends a request to this one or this URL, either one, uh, Flask is going to first run this function. And this allows me to, uh, <clears throat> to do uh, common generic stuff that applies to, to the entire project or so sometimes a subset, but in, in this case it's to, to all the URLs. And uh, what I do here is I make sure that this votes uh, list, the session votes list is created. So if, if it doesn't exist in the session, I create it as an empty list. And that way, when I come here to the votes, I don't need to worry about uh, checking if this exists or not. It's already created. So there you go. I, uh, I, I don't have this published. I, I bet some of you would like to see this. Uh, and I promise in, in, in the, the following weeks, but before the next one, I'm going to try to have this published and, and that, that will also give you a chance to see the, uh, the JavaScript side if you're interested. And uh, in case you're curious, it, it's a React application. Uh, I don't like React and I don't like Angular, uh, but I'm, I, I forced myself to, um, to use React to see if I, if I can like it. So far, it's not going well, but anyway. <laughs> um, so uh, what I'm going to do now is uh, I'm going to refresh, and uh, I don't know if if if, uh, if those of you who voted would like to exit the uh, the site and uh, allow others to connect, uh, and uh, I mean if if you want to cast additional votes, uh, feel free. Uh, I'm going to start answering questions from here, and we have we have about ten ten minutes to 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 the hour, so uh, probably do that. So I'm going to start from from the top. What is the new what, what is new in the second edition of your O'Reilly book? OK, um, so sorry, I'm going to switch 
switch back to my uh, beautiful face so that you see me. Um, so uh, what's new in this guide, so, so th this is the, the first edition. I, I don't have the second edition paperback yet. Uh, you, you, you can tell because the, the new book has a black bar here that reads uh, second edition. So make sure you get the, the second one. This one is no good anymore. Uh, so uh, there is not a lot that's different on, on the second edition. Um, the, um, the, the main thing is basically I, I went through the book and refreshed everything so that it is up to date with current versions of Flask. Um, Flask was at, if I remember correctly, it was 0 0.10 when when this first edition came out four years ago, and now we are at 0.12.2, I think. Uh, the the only really big thing that changed is the the CLI. The uh, the 0 0.10 version does not have a CLI. In those days, people used an extension to create command line interfaces it was uh, that, that was called flask script and this book the first edition uses that that extension uh, the new book uses the cli so i i removed any usages of flask script and uh, and replaced it with the cli uh, the other big change is i added a section on docker containers and how, how to containerize a flask application uh, Back in those days, Docker did exist, but uh, I don't know. I guess I, I wasn't really that, that much exposed to it. Uh, I, I think containers and uh, microservices, you know, all, all those things, you know, started to uh, take momentum after the first edition came up. So um, there, there's a section on how to work with Docker. And, and then there is a, a lot of little changes all over the place, uh, little improvements. Uh, but basically, I touched every every single chapter, so all the chapters have changed in small ways. Uh, if you want to know if you should buy this version, if you have the first edition, uh, I don't know, uh, probably not, unless you are really interested in the new stuff. That, that would be my advice. Uh, okay, uh, better to order the mega tutorial from your website than Amazon. More, <laughs> more money to you. Uh, absolutely, yes, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, so I, 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 honestly, I put it on Amazon because you, you need to be on Amazon so that you get reviews, and that that's basically the way uh, the popularity and the uh, the usefulness of a of a book is measured these days, unfortunately. Uh, but it, but yes, I I make very little money on the books that I sell on on Amazon. Uh, so yeah. Uh, okay, this one I don't need to answer. If a session is unique per user, does it mean if I will vote for a question, clear my set? Oh, we have a hacker here. <laughs> uh, yes. For for this project, the the way I designed this project in three hours yesterday night, uh, absolutely, you can clear your session, and then you will be able to check the system and vote again. Yes. Uh, so uh, when I complete this application, uh, the votes are going to be stored in the database. There's going to be a user database. So uh, it's not going to be stored in a session, which is very easy to, uh, to erase. Uh, the, um, for those that don't know, the, uh, the, this, this, this session object that I'm using is stored in a cookie. So it's actually, you, you have it. All of you have your own sessions. So um, the cookie is uh, crypt uh, cryptographically signed, so you, you cannot fake the contents of the cookie, uh, but you can delete it. So if you delete it, then the next time you try to vote, the server's going to think that you, you're new, that, that you never voted. Uh, so definitely. So uh, yeah, send pause. Congratulations. Uh, Next, could you recommend a place where I can learn just uh, just enough JavaScript to develop the kind of applications needed for a web developer? Uh, wow. Um, unfortunately, JavaScript is a difficult language, in, in my opinion. Uh, do I... Do I there's, um, 
There's a book. It, it's a little bit old now. Um, uh, it's called JavaScript: The Good Parts. Uh, I, I like that book. Uh, uh, ba- basically, it, til- it tells you. Uh, it it, it uh, sort of promotes a subset of the entire language that is uh, more sane to use. There are some some things in JavaScript that are kind of crazy. Uh, so so that that would be uh, something I would recommend. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I think uh, these days where, where uh, people use, uh, you know, the, these, these uh, single-page application frameworks like Angular, React, uh, a lot of people don't spend enough time learning the language, the, the JavaScript base, and, and that's why I, I, I think for, for many people it's difficult. Uh, if, if you start from React or Angular, uh, you're gonna have a hard time. Uh, so I, I suggest you uh, you uh, install, for example, Node.js, which is a uh, a version of JavaScript that you can run without a browser. Uh, you, you can run it as uh, you can even write uh, server side backend applications in, in a way similar to the, the kind of things you can do with Flask, uh, and and learn the language, and and then uh, I think. When, when you then take on the frameworks, uh, things are going to look, they're going to make a, a little bit more sense. Um, okay, next. Have you ever tried pipemb for manipulating virtual environments and packages? If yes, what do you think about it? Yeah, I did. I don't like it. Uh, I, I think it's not ready for production use. Uh, I think it shows promise. Um, but uh, but I, uh, I, I don't use it myself. I uh, actually I can show you. Uh, so, so the the, uh, the the great thing about pipenv, in my opinion, I mean, it has a number of things that are nice. But the, the the most important by far thing that pipenv does that when you work without pipenv you don't have is a much uh, clear way to manage your requirements by having the uh, the pip file where you specify your dependencies and then the log file where you have all the dependencies with the exact versions and then all the secondary dependencies um, so um, that that that's that to me is the reason why I would use pipenv uh, but um, we we tried it at work uh, actually and I tried it myself for my own stuff uh, so pipenv is uh, is slow it shells to pip uh, for everything that it installs, so it, it takes consistently longer than than pip uh, to install. So uh, that that's something. If if, if uh, when you're doing this for for real on a uh, you know on on a production project, uh, you you probably have a build uh, script that runs automatically when someone makes a change, and we, we have that at uh, Rackspace where I work, and we we found that it it, it takes a long time. Uh, Basically, it, it adds time to the build, um, and also um, pipenv. If if you uh, all you need to do is go look at the uh, if you go to the, uh, the repository on GitHub and look at the commits, you're gonna see that uh, th- there's a lot of activity. It's changing all the time. The the the, uh, the developers uh, have this uh, style of making commits direct to master. They they don't use pull requests. They don't use code reviews. Um, so uh, in our experience, we used it at Rackspace for about a month and then decided to stop. And we we uh, in in that month our builds broke I think three times because of changes that went uh, that went into the uh, official releases that uh, that that had bugs. So uh, it's, it's definitely something something that I will continue to monitor and. Uh, will probably advertise it at a point where I consider that it's uh, safe to use. Uh, but um, I, I, th- I think if you, if you use it for uh, for small projects, it's, it's fine. Uh, so, I mean, if, if you like it and, uh, you know, you, you don't have uh, really big requirements out of the tool, then it, it's probably fine and uh, I, I think it, it does a good job. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, uh, I, I'm not using it yet. Uh, what Flask applications do you develop at Rackspace? <clears throat> okay, uh, so what we do at Rackspace, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I was going to show something. Uh, I'm going to go back, sorry. 
for, for this question, the pipenv question, I'm going to show you what I do instead of using uh, instead of using pipenv. Uh, so so this Q and A, th this is the application that I just showed you. So so here's the Python. So what I have is I have a requirements file, and I have a requirements.txt file. So requirements.txt is a file that uh, I don't edit by hand. So I, I edit this guy. So so requirements is the list of requirements. I have Flask, Flask SQL Alchemy, and requests. So what I do is I um, create my virtual environment, uh, import this requirements into it, and then I do pip freeze, and then I redirect the output to requirements.txt. And the uh, basically pip freeze will will show you, I need to update my, my pip here, but anyway, ignore that yellow stuff. Uh, pip freeze shows you the, the exact uh, versions of all the dependencies that you're using. So, <clears throat> sorry. So th this is how I achieve that same kind of thing that pipenv does with the log file. Um, so anyway, so, okay, uh, what I do at Rackspace, uh, so uh, what we do at Rackspace, uh, I, I work in a division that's called um, manage, uh, manage security. Uh, basically, companies pay us money so that we keep their systems secure and free of uh, any attacks and uh, vulnerabilities, that type of thing. Um, what I do is I work on some systems that are used mostly internally, but some, some of them are also accessible to our customers. Uh, uh, we, we use microservices, which is uh, basically uh, the idea of uh, taking a big application and instead of writing a single backend for it, uh, basically split it, split it in multiple parts, smaller parts. Uh, so, so we have uh, Flask uh, microservices. So each microservice is based on Flask. Uh, we deploy them on AWS Lambda, which is, uh, you, you may have heard of this uh, this term that a lot of people say these days, serverless. Uh, so uh, we, we deploy our Flask applications to uh, AWS Lambda, uh, which requires us to not maintain any servers. And it's really nice. And uh, yeah, the, the, uh, an area that I spend a lot of time is the authentication uh, microservice. Uh, so, so we have uh, we have uh, tokens, uh, token generation, token impersonation, a, a bunch of uh, interesting things that that we use, and, and there are uh, other other uh, you know, micro workers uh, need to use to uh, basically to to provide the service to uh, to our customers. So, yeah, that's what I do. Uh, so, okay, it's been four minutes over the hour. I'm gonna try to get through a few more. Uh, so does the Flask Bootstrap extension gets updated as Bootstrap releases a new version? Uh, yes, as far as I know, the uh, the Flask Bootstrap developer uh, keeps the, the version numbers on his extension uh, in sync with Flask uh, in sync with the Bootstrap JavaScript libraries. Uh, I haven't checked if he released one for Bootstrap four. I think he was waiting for uh, for Bootstrap four to be out of beta to do that. So it may not be out yet. Uh, the, the, the version that I use uh, in both of my books is uh, version 3. Uh, how is it possible to make some kind of authentication which restricts access to static files like images, documents, to logged in users? <clears throat> well, th this is an interesting question. Um, so you, uh, th 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 there are a couple ways to do this. Uh, for development, you can uh, you, you know that uh, Flask has the static route. This is a route that's predefined uh, that serves the static files. Uh, you don't have to use that. You, you can create your own route. So you can create a different route and uh, add any uh, you know uh, Flask login decorator or Flask HTTP auth, you know, wh whatever you use. Uh, so decorate the function and then to serve the file, you can use the Flask function uh, that's called send file. Uh, so th that, that, that's one way. Uh, for production, what I would do is uh, typically I, I deploy Nginx in front of my Flask servers 
And uh, what I will do then is in Engine X, you can uh, you can have there, there's an option. I don't remember the name uh, right now, but you you can tell it for any files that Engine X serves directly, any static files. Uh, you can tell it to send a request to any uh, endpoint of your choosing to uh, to check for authentication before it serves it. So so then you you can have your you, you can have a Flask uh, route that's dedicated to verify authentication and yet continue to serve static files with nginx. Okay, next, uh, beginner. If I were to develop my personal blog, understand that I need a form for posting my blogs to the servers so that I can be viewed by others. How do I restrict the viewers from accessing this form used to submit blogs? Uh, you, you, you're gonna need yeah, user authentication in that case. Uh, so th this is covered in, in both of the books, and uh, you can also see it on my blog. Uh, if, if you look for authentication posts in the, uh, if you look in the blog categories, uh, I, I wrote a bunch about this topic. So basically, you're gonna have to log in to your own blog, and that, that's what I do for my blog. I log into my blog, and then the blog knows who I am, and then it shows me a more enhanced version of the blog. It's not what you see when you go to my blog. I, I get additional options in the in the top navigation bar that allow me to uh, to write uh, blog posts. Next, what is the best library or way to use Flask with MongoDB? Uh, okay, great. Uh, I don't know uh, because I don't use Mongo myself. Uh, so uh, I would probably use Mongo Engine if I had to. Uh, but I, I I don't really use Mongo. It, it's been a while since the last time I used Mongo, so I would probably have to revisit this and, and see if there's anything better in the Python world. Uh, this, this is something important that uh, you, you don't have to look for extensions that are specific to Flask if you don't want to. If there's a great extension that doesn't have, uh, I'm sorry, if, if there's a great Python package that doesn't have an extension for Flask, you can still use it. Flask is totally fine with it. So yes, I will probably just do uh, survey um, the, the the Python package repository and see what's what's out there, and uh, find find what works uh, best. But unfortunately, yeah, I, I I don't know off the top of my mind. Uh, next, after we have gone through your mega tutorial, how do we keep updated about the new Flask features, updates, etc.? Uh, uh, what I would you know what, what I would do is I will keep an eye on the activity on the Flask uh, GitHub repository. Um, so uh, technically I'm a, I'm a core developer in the Flask project. I, I don't really participate much uh, in the day-to-day -day development. Uh, there are uh, a, a couple, two, two three uh, other core developers that really do a great job uh, keeping track, you know, p pushing the development forward. And uh, but what I do, even though I don't participate actively a lot, I I have it. You know, I I start the project, so I, I see the changes that go on on my GitHub uh, feed. So every day I check what's going on, and when I find something that's interesting or, or something that I that I see that it's wrong, then I I get involved. Uh, so you should do that too. You you should keep an eye on the changes that are going in. Um, the, uh, the release schedule, it's kind of slow. Uh, there are a bunch of things that are in master, for example, that are not in the official version. So, uh, you know, uh, if, if you check those out, you might, you might find uh, stuff that uh, that's coming that, uh, that you, 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 I mean, you, you can install Flask from master and start using today. Uh, because in general, the, the project is uh, very, very stable. Uh, so. Oh, great. So, oh, crap. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay, you can tell that I'm a beginner at this. Uh, okay, sorry, I'm gonna, I'm gonna switch to the screen. Uh, man, there we go. Uh, okay, so uh, what I was, uh, I, th I think, yeah, the, the only thing I showed you is this, uh, this requirements thing. Uh, uh, yeah, you, you you were seeing me instead of the screen. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, so it's this 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 is my requirements.txt file and this is my requirements file. So I, I keep I, I edit this file and then export 
to this other file. Sorry about that. Uh, hopefully you, you, I don't remember when I switched, but hopefully you didn't miss a lot. Um, that's that's the problem when I have no feedback, I guess. Uh, but anyway, <clears throat> uh, I'm going to uh, go to the next one. You forgot to show us your terminal window. Thank you. Thank you for making me feel like a fool. Thanks. Can you, in the future, give an example of running Flask in AWS Lambda? Uh, sure, I, I could. Uh, because that that's actually what I do at work and uh, okay the next question is related do you use Zappa for lambdas uh, I, I don't uh, so uh, what I do for for the deployment of uh, of our uh, serverless uh, flask applications is I wrote a little um, whiskey adapter so uh, whiskey or uh, WSGI is the uh, the format that applications use to um, export uh, web applications use to export uh, the application to a web server. So uh, what I did is uh, I created an adapter that invokes the application in the same way a web server invokes it, and uh, and then the uh, on the other side this application uh, uses the format that. Um, that uh, API Gateway and AWS Lambda use for for their own thing. Uh, it's called the, the proxy integration, if you look it up in the docs. Uh, so the, the proxy integration in AWS Serverless is kind of similar to WSGI uh, in the sense that they, they both have, uh, they accomplish the same goal, uh, but the format is different. So what I wrote is an adapter, and that, that's the same thing that Zappa does. Uh, so, so mine is it's simpler. It's just a little function that uses uh, Verzoic to create a, a whiskey environment, and then it invokes the application. I, um, I, I don't think Zappa will work for for us at Rackspace. Uh, we we have our own framework, um, so so I, I I think it's not uh, it's, it's not going to work because uh, Zappa not only deploys your function, it set up, sets up your domain, it, it does a bunch of other things that, uh, that we re really don't need because we, we do it in a different way. So, uh, so yeah, yeah, we have our own thing. Um, so anyway, uh, unless uh, there's any final questions, I think I'm gonna end this. Um, I apologize for the, for the screen, I have to keep track of that. Um, so anyway, maybe I need an assistant. Next, next time I, I may name an assistant and uh, I'm gonna have him on, on audio so that if, if there's any problem, I can you know, I can get alerted in, in time. Uh, so anyway, it's a learning experience. Uh, so uh, next time, hopefully it'll be, uh, it'll be a little better. Uh, okay. So uh, let's see, switch one more time to my face and uh, yeah, uh, I hope you found this uh, useful. Uh, remember that uh, I, I have the uh, the mega tutorial on discount on my site, which is learn.miguelgreenberg.com. Uh, if you were thinking about getting it, uh, this is a good time. If you have the ebook and want to upgrade to the uh, to get the video, which is basically uh, I'm, I'm me going through the entire tutorial, um, uh, you, and, and you can watch my screen. Uh, that, that's also on discount, so the upgrade from ebook to video is also discounted heavily. Uh, so, uh, so yeah. Uh, if you have any ideas for topics uh, that that I can do next time, uh, one that I was thinking that maybe I do is uh, talk about the application and request contexts in Flask, which is something that a lot of people get confused. Um, so. Uh, but, but yeah, if, if you have any other ideas, let me know. And maybe roughly in a month from now, uh, I'll do another one of these uh, and uh, we'll, we'll keep, uh, keep doing this. So uh, thank you very much for joining and uh, I guess I'll see you next time. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, hit me on Twitter or uh, whatever else you find me. Goodbye. Thank you.